First came export controls, then came tariffs. Now it's the return of TikTok and the shock of deep seeks R1 and improvements in Huawei's chip yields. And just like that, the US and China tech conflict has kicked into a new gear. What we're watching is no longer just policy, it's pressure unfolding across code, silicon, and markets. Welcome to our video commentary series. I'm Louise Marie Urell. I'm part of our cyber and tech team here at RUSI, and today I'm joined here by Dr. Toby Fieken. Uh, he is a former Australian uh, cyber and tech ambassador. He's the founder of Protostar Strategy, and he's also RUSI Senior Associate Fellow. And today we'll be unpacking a bit of the latest developments on the US-China tech and trade war. So Toby, let's start with Washington. So since 2018, we know that there has been a series of export controls and now tariffs, right? Uh, focusing on slowing China's uh, development on tech, and especially AI. And this year we saw DeepSeek's release, uh, we saw Huawei kind of developing its own chips. Um, so what are, what are these economic deterrence tools and are they actually effective in slowing down China's tech development? Yeah, you know, these are big questions. This is a card that the US has been playing, as you say, since 2018. Mm -hmm. You've seen consecutive administrations continue this theme from Trump when he was first in power, all the way through the Biden administration, building up these tariffs, especially, as you say, in the semiconductor industry sector. And now, I mean, it's hard to keep up in a way with where these tariffs are heading because the size of the tariffs seem to keep doubling, quadrupling. And tech is squarely in the middle of those. And as we found out this week, semiconductors are squarely in the spotlight. Um, so what they're aimed at doing is just narrowing China's ability to innovate around high-end, especially high-end chipsets in the AI sector. Um, but what we've seen is actually um, that space that this was intended to provide the US ecosystem to innovate around has narrowed rapidly because you know there's an old adage necessity is the mother of all invention right and and actually what we've seen is China innovate at a rate of knots that we wouldn't have expected so we saw deep sea come out which is an open weighted AI system which is that mixture of both open source AI along with some proprietorial methods but it's um, really you know upended the AI market. Mm -hmm. So China can't develop frontier AI models, the most expensive type, which is where US has really placed mm -hmm. a huge amount of emphasis. Um, so it's developed other workarounds um, mm -hmm. to ensure that it can use lower end chipsets, use the higher end chipsets that is stockpiled and make sure that it's actually in the AI geopolitical game. And it's squarely in there now mm -hmm. with the developments that it's made. You rightfully mentioned, you know, Huawei last year, its chip yields went up from 30% to 50% in a year. That's an incredible mm. growth set, and that gives it a lot more market force. But, you know, let's not get ourselves too far gone in this. You know, there is an asymmetry to all mm. of this. Um, you know, US companies still have enormous market share, mm -hmm. even in China last year. The big firms made around 38 billion US dollars in the Chinese market and Chinese companies are still reliant heavily on certain aspects of Western um, capability yes. in order that they can deliver. So, you know, as much as China can push back, fight back, mm. um, still the power lays in the US hands. For how long? We're not sure, but right now that's the way the global ecosystem is built. Mm. Interesting, and I think that also kind of it also brings us to the point of how much China can adapt and how much room for maneuvering they do have there. But at the end of the day, we're also talking about these different ecosystems uh, across like private sector, in Silicon Valley, but also in Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. So what is then the stake of these companies, right? I mean, because obviously we saw with DeepSeek, um, that they became the, you know, the, the, let's say the star of the moment for uh, the government and they trying to roll out very quickly the use of deep seek across government and other parts of the public sector and private, right? Um, so how do you see within this broader tech competition and let's say this interdependency, which is still there, how do you see both private ecosystems kind of interacting within this broader context? I mean, firstly, with increasing difficulty, mm. right? Because the interdependence is enormous between the yeah. two. 
and trying to decouple them, which is you know a term we hear a lot now in, yeah. in the discourse. Um, trying to fully decouple them is going to be a very painful process. Um, so there's still that complete reliance on each other. But what we are seeing is that companies in the US, tech firms in the US, are certainly trying to ensure um, that they are ready for these tariffs. So if you're, they're building kind of separate ecosystems, mm -hmm. ready to go so that they can still, to be honest, bypass some of the export controls that the US has placed upon them. You know, they have to innovate around this too. They still have margins that they need to maintain, growth models that they're looking to push. Mm -hmm. So they're building completely separate, um, if you like, trading regimes in order that they can keep in that market space. But what this is doing geopolitically is it's putting a squeeze on a lot of partners um, around the world. You know, there's been a dissemination of, um, of uh, different locations for chip manufacturing, um, for various aspects of, of the chip manufacturing process. And these tariffs are putting huge pressure, as is the US government, on trying to make sure that these tariffs are maintained. So there's huge pressure going on governments to make sure that they are not inadvertently becoming a, a transfer center for certain chipsets. And there's huge pressure now on tech firms to ensure that they are adhering to these methods. I mean, one of the biggest results that you're gonna see is a sharp increase in the price of high-end chipsets. And we know that Nvidia is already in that space, but expect to see you know, prices of these commodities growing rapidly over the coming months. And that's super interesting, right? Because I, I mean, I, I go back to the point on government response right now, mm. because I'm thinking about lawfare, and I'm thinking about China adapting slowly but surely within this ecosystem of, of tension. So going back to the point on economic deterrence, mm. how much are we seeing of the same tools that the US is kind of deploying or deployed that China is also deploying in their own yep. approach to kind of putting a sting on the US? Yeah, I mean, really good point. I think it's really important to state firstly, though, that you know China is no stranger to using economic coercion as a tool of statecraft, yeah. right? And living in Australia, that's something we felt acutely, as have many other countries around the world at certain points. Um, so they're used to this, but you're right, they've understood some of the US playbook and they are, if you like, playing that back mm. in the face um, of the US and the way that they're responding. Um, so it, it, it's certainly uh, an aspect of the Chinese response. Um, and, and I just think you're gonna keep seeing this escalation. But we're already seeing that you know, the US tariffs are squeezing immensely the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing Chinese companies revert to selling internally, where there is a genuinely enormous market environment. Um, but the other aspect of this, with all of this squeeze and pressure that's going on, you know, China using the same playbook and expect to keep seeing that tip for tap, is that because China has developed this, if you like, lower cost model for entry into deploying AI tools, if, if you're, uh, if you like, a, an undecided country who's caught in this pincer movement, it becomes much more attractive yes. to, to pursue your economic development through a lower cost lens. Mm. But because also maybe dealing with a, a US ecosystem isn't as appealing now because of some of the pressures that come alongside that. And I'm being very diplomatic in the way that I capture it. Yes. Um, but, you know, that's also going to be a factor here. So look to see, I think, over the next, you know, six to 12 months, how countries in that middle ground, the undecided nations, how they look to innovate around Chinese ecosystems because for the majority of those populations, they just want economic growth. They want to be able to use these tools for all the reasons that everyone else does, but at that lower cost point, price point. Are we gonna see something similar to, and this is just me poking, okay. something similar to like the 5G debate or de-risking, right? With the US putting more pressure in these countries to like, do not kind of use certain types of advanced kind of technologies, focusing on AI, focusing on, let's say, some models, right? Please don't use that. Are we going to see that? Do you expect that? Or is it too late? So you're definitely asking the right person that question. I was in the government hot seat when all the Huawei decision making process right. were going on. And I think you're right to extrapolate that because I think that's exactly what will happen. You will mm. see increasing amounts of pressure to start making choices about which ecosystem, especially as it begins to split further. Um, you know, and you do see that decoupling more clearly. Mm. You'll absolutely see a lot more diplomatic pressure on countries to make decisions for one or the other. Um, and you know, 
that could well end up in US being the winner, but it could also go completely the other way. And you mentioned the global south. You know, only 4% of AI R&D actually takes place in the global south outside of the big three, and I mean China, US, and EU. Um, you know, so, and that's a, that's a number that you, we really do need to shift. But you know, there are some quite innovative things going on in the global south, whether it be around the kind of data sets that are being formulated there, um, whether it be um, around some of the innovation processes, if you like, the leapfrogging that's going on. But it's just done at a smaller scale um, than you're seeing in other ecosystems. Um, and there is a real danger that um, if there's not more emphasis and investment made in the global south in this regard, that they'll just be left, if you like, absorbing whatever they're given, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not a good place to be. 85% of the world's population are in the global south. And I mean, if we go back to, <laughs> I'm going to say the cliche, you know, data is the, I won't say it's a new gold, but it is gold, right? Um, my God, is that not an enormous kind of treasure trove of learning for AI data sets to feed off the back of. But how do we utilize that in a way that is most economically beneficial for those global South nations and also for you know, the companies that assist them in that journey? Mm -hmm. So I think it's an aspect of this, and I do expect to see much more global South influence in the multilateral uh, sense, the regional settings, um, and the kind of influencing that's going on. I, I, I do think that Global South is going to become increasingly powerful in this regard as we move forward, especially in the AI governance discussion. Well, thank you very much, Toby, for your time, uh, for sharing a bit of your experience as well, like being in government, being in the like private sector, but also having been here at RUSI before. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for, you know, for this short kind of like conversation for joining us. Uh, stay tuned for more work from our cyber and tech research team and make sure to subscribe. <laughs>